Hello, everybody. I am Carrie the Mortician. I am super uh, all natural today. Um, just working from home. It is a dreary point on rain day outside. I'm hanging with my kids and some extra kids at the house. And it is coffee with Carrie time, afternoon style. Got some iced coffee today. A little afternoon pick me up. So needed some uh, little live uh, some caffeine. <laughs> caffeine going today. Yeah, Christina, it's pouring here. I think it missed you down in um, Kalamazoo area. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, so we're gonna dive right in. I don't know how long we're gonna be going and how long these kids will let me have today. So let's see what happens. Um, thanks, Trevor. Yeah, the TikTok. I finally gave into the TikTok and I'm attempting some TikTok. It's a whole different, really, generation than primarily watches my YouTube. My YouTube, if you look at the analytics, is primarily um, kind of 45 to like 65 is kind of the primary age demographic, where TikTok is, you know, teens, 20s primarily. So it's a very different audience. Um, but I think it's good to educate different audiences and generations with the same information. They just see it and hear it in different ways. So we'll see what happens. Who knows? Trying not to um, pull too much away from all of my other areas. I don't want to, you know, dilute out and not put a lot into YouTube, which is where my primary start was here. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, thank you guys. Welcome. Welcome. So Oh, Queen Corp. Yay, you got into your pre-morts. That's awesome. That's awesome, awesome. So um, this first question that I'm answering, can I legally see my dead loved one no matter what? So this question is coming from um, a submission I got. It says, after hearing about the Emmer Emmett Till story, I was wondering if funeral homes are obligated to let families view the body of people who have been physically destroyed or mangled beyond recognition, or can you tell the family no? If families are allowed to see bodies in bad condition, can the family elect to let the general public view the body too, as Emmett Till's mother did way back then? Thank you. So this question, it is so good. Because the Emmett Till story has become so prominent, especially in the last year. There's been a lot of documentaries. So the big thing is they just recently found um, some people doing some research and things that found a warrant for the woman who accused Emmett Till of whistling at her that had never been served to her. So this 80-some-year-old woman has never had to answer for what she did because this warrant was never served. And they are trying to get them to serve this to her. Hopefully, this all happens. Um, as a lot of people said, if you can charge like a 104-year-old man in Germany of Nazi crimes, then why can't you charge her here? So we'll see how it plays out. If you don't know the Emmett Till story, Google it. You have to know the story in American history. It is a pivotal moment. It was a driving force behind Rosa Parks' actions. Dive in. But so what happened? He was severely beaten, abused, tortured, and killed a small boy, small black boy. Um, and his mom advocated and said, we will show him. People will see what was done to him. It was a very public viewing. Um, it was his photo was on the front of a lot of um, publications, magazines, and newspapers and things across the country at the time. So very unheard of for the time. For things like that to be so public, it was important. She did, I think at the time, what was the right thing. I'm sure a lot of people didn't think so. However, so if this was to happen now, it would be spread so much differently. Think of social media and things spreading. Totally different beast at this stage in the game. However, a funeral home then can deny or decline someone the right to see their loved one. Legally, though, yes, they are your loved one. You have ownership over them. And that immediate next to kin can say, yes, I want to see them. The funeral home can say, we will not allow it. You can say, we are calling another funeral home. 
You have every right to do that. There may be reasons, though, they don't want you to see them. Maybe you can come up with a middle ground where if their face is completely destroyed, they can wrap what's left of the face and you can see their hands. So there's middle grounds where you can show a finger, you can show a toe, you can show something. So those things can happen, um, but you do have the right to advocate for yourself or for your family to be able to see someone. If you're going to have a public um, viewing like that, I would assume that in nowadays and then nowadays society, that funeral home would make you sign a million legal documents to take all of the things off of them, because that just seems like lots of lawsuits we need to happen. Those were not as big back then, but now we live in a lawsuit crazy society where people do that. So I think that part of it, it's, it's not the same era that um, we are dealing with. So I think that part of it would be very different too. All right, hold on. I'm going to remind these kids that I'm on a video. Hey. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> Hang in Pittsburgh. Um, all right, let's go at this. Do you ever aspirate from the carotid jugular incision after normal aspiration? <sighs> you can. Some people, um, if a person is large enough, you cannot just aspirate from one injection point down by the belly button because the person may be so long that you can't reach this upper region. So some people will go in through what hole you already have open to get some of the upper. But the problem is you're going through um, breastplate and bone and things up here that might get in the way of angles and things. But our goal is to make as little incisions and holes and things as possible. We don't want to do more then we have to, to the person. So our goal is to do the least amount. So we can use what's already there, what's already open. If someone, let's say they had a drain tube in them somewhere, in their chest, in their stomach, we can just use that hole to aspirate. So we can use holes that are already there if necessary. Because we don't want to make more. All my family wants direct cremation. If dies unexpectedly, can I still see family members before the actual cremation? Not a visitation, just a quick look. If you're the immediate next to kin, and then yes. Um, but let's say, and I've had this happen, your brother dies and his kids say nobody's going to see him. You do not have any right to see him. No. They have the right to authorize it. Or his spouse, if there's a spouse. So I have seen brothers and sisters. I've seen mothers be denied getting to see their kids when it's an adult kid and there is a spouse. So it does not give you the right just because you are relation. Hello in Nebraska. Yeah, Amber. So Amber's bringing up a big thing. I have gotten so many messages from you guys this last week about some naughty, naughty, that's naughty, funeral homes. And I don't know why I'm pointing with my fingers as if I'm like directing air traffic or something today. I've gotten a lot of emails from news media and stuff about naughty funeral homes. The one in Indiana is the biggest probably from this last week where 31 bodies were found in all sorts of decomposing stored situation. I've not read a lot of that. I believe firmly and you guys have heard me say this a lot. Media will put every spin on things that they want. So if you find cremated, rema cremated were, remains were found at the funeral home from like 1992, because nobody picked them up. Like the funeral home didn't do anything bad. They just didn't get picked up. But the media will put spin on it. So you got to take out all media with a grain of salt because you have no idea what the whole picture is and what the whole scenario is. I'm not saying they didn't do something naughty. But you got to get more to the story than what the media gives to you because they want to make it sound as salacious as possible and as naughty as possible. Because a nice story doesn't sell anything. And I found this out firsthand when my niece was murdered, that they took and they said whatever they wanted. They used pictures, whatever they wanted. They put out whatever they wanted and they didn't care. 
anything about the family or anything. It was horrible. So grain of salt, guys. But yes, very bad situation. Got to remember, every funeral home does not have refrigeration. Every funeral home does not have family that cooperates with them. So you may go bring someone into your care and then the family ghosts and nobody will help you or they want you to store them for so long and people don't have refrigeration. It's kind of like this rabbit hole. Well, it's been two days. Well, it's been five days. Well, it's been eight days. Oh crap. Why not just wait another week? I think there's rabbit hole scenario with some of that where you do it once and you do it more and then you push it a little bit. So I don't know the whole story of what was happening there because it's just all hearsay media, but it sounds really bad. Really, really bad. I was telling a friend about aspiration and trocars. It only punctures the organs and sucks the fluid up, right? Or does it actually suck up parts of the organs too? So the holes on a trocar, try to see if I have anything small enough. I mean, they're very small. So if you get big enough tissue, even just... Um, kind of the fat globs. If you've never seen fat globs in human body, they're kind of yellowy and they'll have bulbs and then tissue between and then bulbs again. Well, those can get so big, they clog up into those little holes going into the trocar. In the trocar itself, there's diameter about this. But in the tip, there's these little holes for, so the fluid and things can go in. So yes, you do get some tissue for the most part, it's just fluids, but you do get some tissue, especially some fecal matter and things that go in there. You're sucking up poop. You're sucking up urine. You're sucking up all sorts of things. Hey, Diane Stark, catching me live. And Kathy, I love when you guys get excited. That just makes me so happy. If an autopsy is done, are they automatically embalmed? No. Short answer. If someone, um, Kelly, uh, there's no way, there's no, there's no set time limits on bodies breaking down. There's just nothing when it comes to those things. There's no timelines. Yeah, Christine, there was. And that's um, the place that I have connected to. So um, a lot of uh, questions there still about that. It was very surprising. And yeah. Um, a lot of questions because during that time, the state had come through, I believe, and done an inspection when they hit all the funeral homes in this area. And so it's like, how did you not know something was licensed, not licensed if you inspected it yourselves? But here's the thing, guys. Someone was like, well, how did these things go to the wayside? How did Indiana not know this man was leaving bodies out? In the state of Michigan, there is one human one <laughs> that oversees like all of the funeral homes, all of the barber shops, beauty shops. Like, the, there's not like teams of 20 individuals overseeing funeral homes in the state of Michigan. There is a small one human that is going to work on these things. They don't go out and inspect unless there is a something filed. So in Michigan, I knew of a funeral home that was operating with no manager, no licensed director, no trade embalmer was going there. Bodies were still being embalmed. They were still being taken care of. I called the state to report them. I'm sorry. If you want to report something like that to the state, you must print off the paperwork off of online. You must submit it via snail mail, and we will put it in the review process. It may be about two weeks before you get response for that review. I said, so I am telling you with 100% certainty that some place is operating illegally, and you are telling me by the time I, I get this letter in the mail, you receive it and stuff, it may be almost three weeks before you even respond. That's three weeks of deceased being taken care of illegally. And that's it. And they said, that is our protocol. That's what we have to follow. So you can't just call and report something quickly. It's easier to call the media and to get a dumpster fire going there than it is to actually report something to the state. And I only know this because of my own personal trying to do that. Just to give you a snippet, that's just here. I don't know every state, but that just tells you how hard it is 
to get something reported and how long things may go bad before they get figured out. Just an idea for you. Have you seen different type of blood clot from the deceased? Heard some people have large clots wrapped in white cells. Not specifically. So there is a huge discussion about whether people who have been vaccinated are having a different type of clotting issues and we're seeing it during embalming. We do not ask if someone's been vaccinated. So there is no way for us to like, oh, Mrs. Smith has white clots or whatever because she's vaccinated. We don't know if they're vaccinated or not. It's not something we ask during arrangements. It's not something we ask ever during the process. So we don't know specifically. People come up with these hypotheses and these theories, but it doesn't mean we actually know. Is it appropriate to dispose of body bags and soil personal effects in the trash that overflows? Well, you should wrap it up. Things like that should be put in the biohazard waste to be thrown out. Body bags should go in biohazard. They've been touching the deceased, biohazard. Pretty simple. How did the jet black headstones age? They're very popular these days, but they haven't been around long to know what they'll look like. <sighs> yeah, um, you know, engraving, things wear down. But unlike the stones of, you know, 100 years ago or more where they were legit stone, or that wore away. The granite now is not where doesn't wear in the elements like those stones years and years and years ago did. So it's a different material than they were working with back then. So to me, they're going to wear a lot better. They're going to look a lot better long term. What is not going to is when you have scenes painted, you know, the scenes engraved and etched, the color is going to fade. Those are going to fade quicker. Um, the photos, when you do them in a little like, a, oh, it's almost like a pottery, the clay things that have like a person's picture and you put them on, those are going to fade. Sunlight just fades things. But I don't think that the, the granite's going to wash away or, white, you know, like fade away like the other stuff. How long does COVID stay in the body after death? Well, it's always in the body. It just deactivates at some point. But during the course, it was found after 90 days still to be active in a body. My grandmother died from COVID back on December 19th. And when we viewed her body, my mom kissed her forehead. It was long time that my mom had COVID again. Well, it is a million times more likely that during the viewing, your mom encountered somebody that had COVID that had come to the viewing than her getting it from the deceased. Air has to be expelling out of the person for them to be contagious. They would, she would have been sanitized, wash, embalming fluid is going to kill out, not kill because it can't kill COVID. It becomes inactive. And so it is 1 million billion times more likely that it was caught from somebody that was at the viewing or she had it prior to and didn't realize it. Have you ever had a family who was upset at the presentation and preparation of the deceased? Yes, people, people are unhappy with how somebody looks, but people don't feel they have permission to say something at the time of viewing. There are many things that be, can be corrected when you're having your viewing. That's why the family has private time ahead to see the person is for them to voice if they need something changed rather than just complain to everybody else after, but have never said something to the funeral director. This happens all the time. It's frustrating for the family. It's frustrating for the funeral home because if there's no communication there, how can anybody have known there was a problem until after the fact? Lipstick can be changed. Hair can be changed. Makeup can be changed. You can do a lot in a short period of time to correct it, but nothing can be done if nothing's ever said. So understand that as a family, you can always say something. You may be told there's nothing we can do at this point. Whether the person had edema and they're like 10 times swollen from what they usually were. Funeral director can only do so much about that. They can do stuff about it, but not at the point of viewing. But there's things you can do something about. So voice what you need. See if anything can be done. Help the situation be remedied. Because afterwards it's too late. 
I want the pair of twins. Hey, boys. Oh, JT's mom says um, her son um, had a Marine tattoo, an angel, and his military ID. That's how they identified him. I begged to see them, but they refused. I wish I would have let you see something like his, you know, finger even. Anything. It's my worst case as far as gruesome. I don't know what's gruesome to you. To me, like, I don't like colostomy bags. To me, that's gross. Nothing against anybody who has ostomies at all. Um, but those are gross to me. So it's all a perspective of what you think is gruesome. I know that everybody wants to hear gross, whatever, but I mean, people die in a million different ways. Things drop on them. They get hit by everything. Trains, people fall out of planes, people get hit by boats, get decapitation, legs and arms cut off, disembowelment. It all happens. So I don't know what to you means gross, I guess. If a person dies naturally at home, can you call the funeral home for direct pickup? Only if hospice is involved. If they are not under hospice care, you must dial 911. You must have the ambulance come. You must have the investigators come. They must be then released to the funeral home or go for an autopsy. Jigglatties, I'm seeing that you keep posting. I always wonder what the person feels when they pass. It's going to be forever a question. How about people arrested for selling body parts of people were, yeah, that's just a big, um, big story this last week too, is kind of the final pleading guilty of the people out in, was it Colorado? The woman and her mom who suck and are super naughty, um, who are doing that. Uh, Carrie recently had a friend. A 29 passing asleep is autopsy required is up to the family. So if he has a large, long time pre-existing condition of health conditions, they may not do something more than likely. Yes. They're going to do an autopsy. They're going to check toxicology. They're going to see if he's on medication, was taking drugs, was drinking all of the above to try and find out. So Queen Corf, yes, if your grandpa dies at home, you cannot call the funeral home directly if hospice is not involved. You must call 911. You must go through the ambulance coming, them testing, them possibly shocking him, them checking to see if he is dead. It's You have to go through the process. Do muscles contract after embalming? No. Is it hard to do makeup around tattoos without covering the tattoos, maybe on the hands or neck? Uh, yes, you can't cosmetize over. They will completely cover. It's kind of like freckles. You cover up those identifiable markings of the person if you have to do heavy cosmetics. So hopefully you just have to do tint, which is clear, a little maybe powder to take off the sheen, which I have today because I've literally no makeup on. Um, and maybe a little lip color or something. So hopefully that's the condition, you know, that a person's in, but do the insides of the body explode? Nothing explodes. No. Do ostomies affect how embalming is done? No. We remove them and have an extra hole to suture, but because we take that stoma and we push it in, that's what it's called, right? For some reason I'm questioning, but and you just push it in and then suture up the hole. So Lisa, which hi Lisa, and um, I'm guessing that he had a long time pre-existing condition of heart problems. And it was probably a clear indicative sign that maybe that's what happened. I have a question. My grand nephew passed from SIDS in 2015. Um, well, in SIDS, they're finding that that's not really even allowed anymore because it's not accurate. Most of the time they're finding it's asphyxiation that can't be indicative, like there's no clear indicative nature of how it happened, but it's just positional asphyxiation. So that's a lot of time what's being put because SIDS is not a, really a thing anymore um, in terms of what they deem. Um, 
it is hard. It is hard when there's no distinctive reasoning, but they're finding that a lot of what was SIDS was bumpers on, um, bumpers on cribs, sleeping with the parents, someone accidentally rolling over and it never being known, a blanket, things like that. Um, so it's, it's hard because there's a lot of guilt in some of those situations. Like, oh yeah, but the baby was in bed with me. Like, these are not safe conditions. If you're doing something unsafe, something can happen to the child. You don't want to live with that for the rest of your life. Just you laying with your hand on your baby's chest while the baby goes to sleep can be enough pressure to cut off their breathing. Just think of that. Your hand is enough pressure for that. So parents do what they think is best, but sometimes it can cause a situation that maybe restricts breathing in the child for just long enough, um, but it's never shown or proven. And it's, it is hard because you go through all these emotions, I think, as a parent, that you do have this guilt and this question, what could I have done differently? Is, is there something I could have done differently? Is this something that would have happened regardless? What if I'd have done this? What if I'd have done that? Those are hard situations. No, people don't wake up during embalming, really, like ever. No, the body never explodes during cremation. Would a shunt get removed before cremation? No. Um, there is a bit of math and chemistry. So you take literally um, um, sh like shortened classes in about 10 different areas of study. You're doing public speaking, psychology, social work, math, chemistry, anatomy, all of these different areas that you have to see because we use all of them. We'll holler if you're in Michigan, we'll set something up. With my terminal status, if I die before hospice starts, can I require an autopsy? Can I call funeral home directly? Elizabeth. Um, no, you should not. They should not require an autopsy at all because of your medical history. So it would be very clearly defined that you had this long-term medical history because of the cancer. So you should not have to have an autopsy. So, but I would make sure someone's checking in on you, which they are, I know, um, often. So in case something happens that you're found very quickly. How will it be destroyed? Okay. JT's mom. I got a letter the other day from our coroner saying they have a way for, they have to wait for a year to run more tests on my son if needed. After a year, it will be destroyed. How will it be destroyed? What do they have? Um, they're going to have, so when an autopsy is done, they will take small samples of all the organs they need to, fluid samples of everything, and they will store it. And that is their stuff. So if they have to go back and test for something else later or rerun a test, they have those samples to be able to do. They will then just incinerate. They don't just throw them in the regular garbage. It all gets incinerated, like biomedical waste, all of everything. Hey, JW. Happy birthday in St. Louis. If you had to do a removal on a person that weighs five to 600 pounds, how would you handle it? There's a, very, a lot of variables there, even if they're 100 pounds. Like, where are they? Are they upstairs? Are they in a bedroom? Are they in a back bedroom? Um, you're going to automatically, when you know somebody is of that size, bring extra help. You're going to find out who's at the home that can help. If there's police or, you know, other personnel around, you're going to kind of get a feel for the situation of the home. If you need to bring some kind of extra body mover, a different type of stretcher, things like that. So you have to ask a lot more questions. Hey, Stanley in Georgia. We were so frustrated that my father's doctor made it to my parents' house about 10 minutes before he passed. Is this why we called the funeral home and not 911? Yes. If you are under the care of a medical professional when you die, you do not need to call 911. You can call the funeral home. That means someone is there when the person dies, like hospice or a doctor themselves, which is not as common anymore, or um, they're in a hospital, nursing home, something like that. But if they're at home, 
and they have a doctor, that doesn't count. <laughs> Someone has to watch them die at home of a medical professional or they are under the care of hospice. You're welcome, Elizabeth. My father's gotten cremated. He had a bullet lodged in his spine. The funeral director told me I could get it. The most likely it won't get burned. When I asked for it, they said they didn't have it. Yeah, there's no way to know for sure. Um, metal is one of those things like we don't know if it's going to melt away. It may not. It might. It depends on how hot the retort gets, what burns down, how things are processed, because everything comes out and goes through the processing. And it can get destroyed in the processing. So there's, it's not always there after to be able to give. <laughs> Rhonda, thank you. Yeah, I'm pretty um, smitten with Josh. So <laughs> and you all can't tell. Um, when someone is a multiple organ donor, how does this affect embalming? It, it doesn't affect embalming really any differently than any other thing. You know, someone could get in a car accident and that's going to have the same. We embalm kind of what is in front of us, parts, pieces, destruction, whatever. We have to figure out where short circuits are. And by that, I mean, if they go in and take um, heart valves, things like that, and we can't see in there to know what they took, we just kind of have to figure it out. Same with like a car accident with blunt force trauma to the chest. We don't know if everything's working in there. So all we can do is go through the process like we usually would and see where things don't get distributed. If fluid's not getting to a leg, we have to go towards the arteries of the leg to inject directly there. What does get affected with preservation is when you have long bone donation, where they take the bone from the hip down to the foot, or skin donation, where they take tissue to help the skin off the whole back. You can't suture that up. It is completely exposed tissue that will never get covered. So the person has to go in full plastics, plastic undergarments. Watch my video on it if you haven't. There's no way. You can do some topical preservation, but you can't close that up. That person is going to be a leaky mess regardless of what you do. So all we can do is contain the leaking, get them as dry as we can, put powders in, dress them, casket them. They may look a little bulkier because they're going to have full plastics on. But it's one of those a little given a little take because they made a donation. So yeah, it is. It does change things a little bit. Where's Josh, the crematory guy? Uh, he's working right now. So I'm working from home. Today's my work from home day. So he's at work. So I have pictures all over my room of him that are just not right here. Yeah, Trevor. Oh, there's a lady on my, on TikTok named Mama Tot whose son was shot. It was totally publicized. What are the logistics to keeping the family safe and protected from the media? Yeah, Mama Tot, isn't she the sweetest? Legit. Uh, her, her real name's Ophelia. Literally everybody loves her because she's the sweetest little southern thing. Her son was shot and um, killed. You know, it's hard to protect from the media. We can only do so much. Um, I you will see me turn into a version of me that nobody has seen when media starts trying to infringe on a family and on their time. And as a family is leaving the funeral home, trying to walk to their car or anything, I get a little ugly, get away from that family, let them bury their loved one go. I hate it because they're going through enough. They don't need family. They don't need media up in their faces asking questions that, they have no business knowing the answers to. And I think, yes, when you put yourself out into a public realm, like she has done, it does kind of open a door that most people don't have open to the media being in your business and things. And more people wanting to know what's going on because it's a better news story. But also give her the honor and give her son the honor and respect of letting them go through the process without having to deal with an extra pile of garbage in their way of bad questions and, and just pushing this and stuff. So I think there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. I think there's a time and a place. 
I think you can wait a few days for them to lay their loved one to rest and then do questions and stories and stuff. But it's the media's job. I remember when my niece was killed and we're at my sister's and someone knocked on their door and it was reporter. You could tell she was like the lowest man on the totem pole. She had been told she had to come, had to knock on that door, had to try and get a story. Uh, First thing she said is, I am sorry. I really don't want to be here doing this, but it's my job. And I was told I have to do this. And I appreciated her honesty and I appreciated her saying that because she could have come in there blazing and she could have come in there pushing. She could have tried and pushed and everything. And I said, you know, we're going to put something together and blah, blah, blah. And it was just not the time. Like you don't even have the chance to breathe before someone's in your face trying to ask you questions about what you don't even, you can't even process or get an answer to. So yeah, there's, I have a lot to say about media and stuff. It's hard. Hey, Makeup Maven. Like Holland, Michigan, you're in. Can I come get, show you, have you help me how to do my makeup better? <laughs> how old are your daughters? And what do you think of your YouTube channel? So um, they're both under 10. And they think it's fun that I have a YouTube channel. They get all grossed in it. But as they're growing older, they're understanding that maybe being a mortician isn't the coolest thing. I said, most of your friends don't know what the word mortician means. We don't use, it's a little archa- archaic of a word. Mostly it's funeral director or embalmer, or whatever. But as people find out that I work with the dead and at, you know, that's not as cool that mom does that. So I said, just tell them I'm on YouTube, tell them I'm on YouTube. And I think that's super cool. So it gives them a little something that's not as, you know, death and or dirgy for them to talk about, but they think it's fun. Oh, Jaden, all th- anything you want to ask about the funeral business, just drop it in questions and I'll try and hit with it. Yay, Holland, Michigan. You're not so you're not very far from me. That's awesome. When you did your tour of an embalming room, do the requirements from state to state vary on what is required for hair, air and fluid containment? For the most part, it's the same. So we do what's called stell and pell tests in the embalming room to regulate the airflow. And you wear these little badges. They're both kind of the same, but one is for a 15 minute exposure and one is for a full embalming exposure. So you write down the start time, you pull the tab, and then you cover it back up one after 15 minutes and one at the end of the embalming. And you send those in. Those are tested for how much embal or how much formaldehyde exposure is in them during that time. And you have to be within a certain um, number. And that tells them whether you have sufficient airflow in your prep room or not. This also depends on, oh no, did I dump some fluid during this or not? But it is regulated. That is what makes an embalming room an embalming room. You have to have a machine, you have to have aspiration ability, you have to have air circulation, you have to have a vented fan. So you have to have all these specific things. There's like a list of specific things. So you may go into some old funeral homes that have like a one prep room that they use instead of at all the little chapels. And those little chapels will be kept up to be for embalming, but they haven't embalmed there in, you know, 40, 30 years, whatever it is. But they have all the specifics to be maintained as a funeral home. So who is Josh? Josh is... Um, you're introduced to Josh as Josh, the crematory guy. He answered on a couple of videos, questions about cremation. He was also for 20 some years, a burial vault installer. So about 20 years ago, I met Josh. He, for me, he's been Josh, the vault guy for years. Um, biggest crush in my life about 20 years ago when I was single and stuff, and we've never been single at the same time. So a little over a year ago, um, after my divorce and stuff, him and I kind of decided let's go on a date and let's see what happens. And the rest is magical little history here. So yeah. So I introduced him finally to you guys recently. So we have our own channel called the ick factor where we do a few more little zany things and have chats and things over there. So that's a little more like personal side of my world is over on the ick factor. And over time it was kind of fun because I didn't tell everybody about Josh and his last name is Ickes. So people call him Ick. 
And so when I said the ick factor a long time ago in a video, it was kind of a nod to him. Whenever I'd say I love Josh wine, which I do love Josh wine, but it became kind of a nod to him as well. So kind of a fun thing to do. Um, but yay. Hello in England. You're welcome. JT's mom. How many celebrities have I done? No, none. We don't really have celebrities here in Michigan for the most part. <laughs> Lisa, Josh is Carrie's delicious hunk of a man. He really is uh, delicious. I'm not going to lie. He's, he's pretty hunky. Oh, you also provided service to celebrities. Can we know which ones? No celebrities. Bring back Josh. Oh, I can legally marry you and Josh, can I be your clergy? <laughs> That's funny. Someone had, in one live chat we did over on the ick factor, someone was like, hey, we can do the invitations. We can do this. And I'm like, we're going to simmer this down just a little bit. Like I just got divorced a year ago and we're going to slow but steady. What is a courtesy card permit between states? What are you referring to, Bevan? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yeah, Vern Troyer is from the area. He's buried around here. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you. Yeah, give a shout out to Josh. Isn't he the... Yeah, he's pretty great. I'll show you guys a quick little picture if you want of something. We just had some photos done. And... Um, Thank you for sharing your knowledge. You guys are welcome. Is it weird how people don't know the term modeling? It's really something you only encounter if you work in hospice or around death. So, um, yeah, can you guys see? There's him and his son. So, not too terrible to look at, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so modeling is when your extremities, they start. Do you guys know what modeling is when it comes to like steak, where the white fat lines run between the red tissue? It's that same kind of thing where your skin becomes these weird discolored. You get these white patches because your circulation is slowing and everything is starting to change color and get dark purples and whites and reds and things. So you get this modeling within the tissue and it'll often start in the feet and work its way up. But it's one of the first signs of that active death. Maybe not the first signs, but it's part of active death in hospice. Anybody shout out if I'm telling anything incorrect here. You guys are so welcome. Um, I love doing this channel because the people that share stories with me and how encouraging you guys are and the questions you ask are always great. But you, most people don't realize the depth and variety of questions that people have about death care and how many questions people have been carrying with them for years and years and years. And I've never had a place to ask it. It's, it's unfathomable to me some days when I really think about this. And I'm so glad to be able to provide that and to have the comfort. And I am as honest as it's probably going to come. And I try and do it with tact. Sometimes I get a little fired up. Sometimes I might be short with my words. But I try and just provide an honest answer without going all goth or all kitschy or all whatever. I'm just kind of like, if you guys can't tell from today, I am just kind of me. <laughs> like, this is me. I got up this morning. I sat on my porch, start, I kept working on a, my book. Um, Joelle, the grave woman the other day kind of gave me a book kicking. She said, if it's not today, then when work on your book, get going on it. She's like, I want to read it. I'm sure people want to read what you want to write. So do it. So I'm like, okay. I need to focus. I need to carve time every day to work on it, to get it going. So I was working on that this morning, but so this is just rolling with it. Kelly, Josh and his son. Nice eye candy. Yeah. Not too shabby. 
He does play with fire. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Desert. <laughs> How pregnant is your butt? I don't think I knew you were pregnant. How pregnant is your butt? And I love Elizabeth Mann saying, I'm going to mortuary school because I've been watching your channel. Like that is mind blowing to me. Honest to God, just mm, mind blowing. Do all bodies stink the same? No. Does it depend on their diet? Not really. Bodies can smell, yes, from cleanliness. And, you know, if they smoked, they're obviously going to smell like old cigarettes sometimes if they, you know, live in the smoke and things. Um, but sometimes it's going to depend on where their death occurred. If they're in a cooler, if they're at the morgue at the M medical examiner's office, there's a specific smell to the medical examiner's office coolers. Very specific. You can tell if a body has been there and it doesn't always wash off. Well, that's Jay. I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's a good one. Like my concepts are there and I love, I have a fiction and a nonfiction and I have a ton of notes and I have a lot written up on both. Um, I also have a kid's book that I've been toying with. Um, but I never focus time on that. I'm such a doer and focus on everyone else so much. It's hard to focus on something I really want to complete. So I'm like, nope, this is it. And I'm listening to Joelle. She's kicking my butt. So thank you, Joelle. Um, but I'm going to try and focus and really pour into that. I believe in Canada, there's four plots per headstone. My aunt and uncle are on the reverse side of my parents. Is it possible that in the old days, that any predeceased children would have buried there? Possibly. Typically, you can do at least two people on a grave if one's a child or cremated remains, or if it's a double depth grave, obviously. Um, but there could be a baby up under the headstone or, or something too. Day by day, hunk is an understatement. You guys are so cute. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think he's pretty dishy. I always have. So, and what's beautiful is how much we've, aged together and kind of enjoy where we're at in this stage of life. You know, I think sometimes we always wish we were younger. We wish we were this, we wish we were that. And I just, I love and salt and pepper and I love how he is right at this moment. Um, and he appreciates me. Um, I just told my girls today, find somebody who looks at you like you are just the best thing ever because it's the best feeling. So it's kind of awesome. Yeah, Lisa, you are my person. Yeah, let me know. Ick factor, Bonnie. Oh, you're telling her. Okay, let's see, 48 minutes. I always, I like to dial down. My butt is 20 weeks pregnant. I didn't know. I'm so excited for you. Congratulations. That's exciting. Thank you, guys. I'm going to dial down. Yeah, he is a silver fox. No, no lie. Um, I appreciate you guys. Keep questions coming. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to keep up with comments. I need to do some comments catching up on the videos and stuff and have some more videos. I got to get editing is what I need to do this week. So a little less time in my days with the girls home, but I will never trade time with them for anything. So it's nice to spend a little more time with them and just hang out and yeah, they're reading machines. So it's fun watching them read and learn and get excited about reading. So I'm trying to take that reading time and turn it into mom does work while you read. Yay. So that's kind of fun this summer too. So appreciate you guys. Click the thumbs up, share a video. If you find a video that means something to you, share it with somebody. Somebody else needs to hear a lot of this information too. Just share it. Thank you. Click subscribe if you don't subscribe. But I'll see you guys soon. Have a great weekend. Bye.